Hello, I'm Carrie Garrison Laney. I'm a coastal hazards expert with Washington Sea Grant, and I'm going to kick off the webinar today by talking about tsunami sources in Washington State and some of the geologic evidence for past tsunami events. In Washington, we know we have several different tsunami sources. These include tsunamis generated by Cascadia subduction zone earthquakes, tsunamis that form on, after earthquakes on crustal faults. An example of this is the Seattle Fault. Tsunamis formed by landslides, either into or underwater. And these landslides can either be triggered by earthquakes or just happen without earthquakes. And we also know that we can get distant source tsunamis. And an example of this is the 1964 Alaska earthquake tsunami, which made it all the way um, down the west coast of the US and caused damage in many locations. I'm going to start off by showing this animation of how tsunamis form. And here we see an earthquake causing deformation on the ocean floor, lifting up part of the seabed. And that displaces all of the overlying water and generates a wave that moves out in all directions. In deep water, the wave moves very quickly and has a lower wave height. But as it gets to shallower water, the frictional forces at the floor of the ocean start to act on the water and cause the wave height to increase and the speed slow down. And as the trough hits the shore, this causes a big drawdown of ocean level and the, the coastline appears to recede out. That's an indication that a tsunami is on the way, as well as the earthquake itself. As the tsunami approaches, you really get an idea of what a relentless force this is. The entire water column rushes onto land, very different from normal wind-generated waves. And waves can keep coming for many hours after the event. Now I'm going to talk about the seismic sources for tsunamis in Washington. In this picture, we are looking at a cross section through Washington to show all three sources of uh, potential tsunami sources. So uh, we've got subduction zone earthquakes here. Shallow earthquakes are depicted here. These are on faults in the North America plate and also earthquakes that form deep underground in the subducting Juan de Fuca plate. And I'll talk about each one of these in some detail now. First, I'll talk about Cascadia. So Cascadia earthquakes are earthquakes that occur at the interface between the subducting oceanic crust of the Juan de Fuca plate and the overlying continental crust of the North America plate. So these earthquakes are generated at uh, where these two plates are in contact. And we know that in the next 50 years, there's about a 10 to 14% chance of a magnitude 9 great earthquake and about a 30% chance of a magnitude 8 earthquake. And these earthquakes, magnitude 9 earthquakes, recur uh, about every 430 years for the southern part of the Washington coastline to about every 500 years for the northern part. And these numbers vary because uh, we believe that there, there are more earthquakes in the southern part of Cascadia than in the northern part. So as you mo move north, there are fewer earthquake events, and that affects the recurrence. And well, what is recurrence? Actually, recurrence is just dividing the amount of time by the number of earthquakes. It just gives you an average idea about how often these things reoccur but it doesn't tell you exactly how long it is between each earthquake. This map is showing the 20 largest earthquake locations for the last 100 years or so. And it includes 
the top four largest ever known earthquakes um, for the last hundred years that have been measured. Uh, the, the largest one was in 1960, magnitude 9.5 in Chile. Second largest in 1964, magnitude 9.2 in Alaska. And then the 2004 and 2011 uh, earthquakes which were both about magnitude 9.1. And you'll notice that the Cascadia subduction zone does not have an earthquake plotted. And that's because Cascadia has not experienced a great earthquake since the year 1700. Now, in the animation I showed you, we saw that piece of seabed popping up and this is a map view of where you would expect areas where the seafloor would move up versus areas where the, where the coastline may subside. So in this plot, areas that go up during an earthquake are shown in red, and areas that will subside or sink down are shown in blue. And notice that the areas that subside sort of hug right along the coastline. Now, this cycle of the coastline dropping down is actually preserved in lots of different sites in southwest Washington especially. And this is a picture of uh, one of the most famous sites, and that's called the Copalis River Ghost Forest. And what you're seeing here are the remains of a forest of red cedar and Douglas fir that used to be higher up and then they dropped down suddenly during the 1700 earthquake. And now these trees all died as a result because they get tide water over them regularly. Well, when the tides are at their highest, they're completely covering this marsh that you can see here. And what this looks like in terms of the geologic record is something like this. So this is a different site, not too far away, where you can see dark brown forest soil at the bottom. And then on top of that is gray and also oxidizing orange intertidal mud. So this is deposits that form as the tides go in and out over time. And that goes all the way to the surface. But what's also interesting here is that you can see a tsunami deposit. And there are different layers of sand here and those are thought to represent individual waves in a tsunami event. And this is from the last big Cascadia event in 1700. Now, if you look at evidence from on land and also evidence from offshore, you can put together a very nice long timeline of Cascadia earthquakes. This is showing the last 10,000 years of Cascadia earthquakes. And the taller bars are larger magnitude earthquakes like magnitude 9. And then this sh these shorter ones are magnitude 8, which are still very large earthquakes. Now, um, there are only seven earthquakes, Cascadia earthquakes, in the last 3,500 years in Washington, um, just based on the land records. but if you can look at the sediments offshore in the deep ocean canyons, you can actually see deposits from great earthquake events, and these are called turbidites. And combining those two uh, pieces of evidence, that's how you can come up with this very nice long timeline, which tells us we've had about 23 great earthquakes in Cascadia over the last, last 10,000 years. And this is really important for understanding what our future hazards may be. You might wonder what a Cascadia tsunami will do as it moves inland into the Puget Sound area. And uh, Karina Allen will be talking about that more just after me, but I wanted to show you sort of a snapshot of maximum wave heights from a modeled Cascadia earthquake tsunami offshore. And uh, the city of Seattle is right here, and Tacoma, and Olympia. And what this is showing is that the tsunami is not going to be the same height everywhere, 
but in some places it will be a significant event. And aside from wave heights, we also have to be concerned with dangerous currents, which will also be discussed more later. The next source I wanted to talk about are shallow faults, places where they cross the seafloor, they are able to generate tsunamis as well. Now we've got lots of shallow faults crisscrossing Washington State and after studying many different faults uh, we've got kind of a group, um, a group likelihood for all of them put together and that is 15% chance of a magnitude 6.5 or larger earthquake in the next 50 years. And these have recurrence times of in the hundreds to thousands of years, depending on which fault you are looking at. Um, an example of one of these faults making a tsunami um, is shown here on this map. This is the Seattle Fault Zone. And this is how long ago the last event on that fault was. And there you can see other faults and, and uh, ages plotted here. And these are uh, recent, the most recent earthquakes on some of these faults. And these uh, recent, that's geologically speaking, recent. And I've circled ones uh, that we know or, or almost completely certain um, also generated tsunamis. So Seattle Fault did. And also, interestingly, um, this Lake Creek, Boundary Creek Fault, which runs through Lake Crescent, also generated a tsunami about 1,300 years ago. So if you feel a large earthquake, it's not just the marine coasts you need to be worried about. You need to be away from any large bodies of water. Now, Seattle Fault crosses through Puget Sound and cuts through the southern end of Bainbridge Island. And during that last earthquake 1,100 years ago, there was eight meters or about 26 feet of uplift. And that happened from the southern end of Bainbridge Island, which we can see here. And this flat green area that's now a golf course used to be down beneath the waves. And this is what we call a wave cut platform. And that was lifted suddenly during that earthquake. And that uplift also occurred underwater in Puget Sound and generated a tsunami that headed to the north and left geologic evidence in a few places. And one of those, uh, the, where, where the best evidence and the largest or thickest tsunami deposit is, is on the southern end of Whidbey Island at Cultus Bay. And you can see this arrow is pointing at the sand layer left behind by the tsunami. But we know we also have lots of other faults and we don't know exactly uh, how to characterize almost three fourths of them. Uh, this map is showing everything that's been active in the Quaternary period, which is um, a little more than uh, two million years ago or about two million years ago. Um, but so for some of these faults, we know that they've been active, but we don't necessarily know uh, when the last earthquake was and how frequently they experience earthquakes. So there's still a lot to figure out. The next source I'd like to talk about are deep earthquakes. And these are earthquakes that occur in, within the Juan de Fuca plate as it deforms because it's being shoved down um, beneath the North America plate. Now these are our most frequent earthquake source, and we know that we've got about an 84% chance of having a magnitude 6.5 or larger earthquake in the next 50 years. These earthquakes recur on average between every 30 and 50 years, and the last large earthquake of this type that we had in um, Puget Sound in Washington was in 2001, the Nisqually earthquake. Now these types of earthquakes can't generate a tsunami directly like what we saw in the video, but what they can do is they can trigger landslides. These landslides can either occur completely underwater or they can involve uh, landsliding into water which displaces water. This map is showing uh, plot uh, orange dots that are showing places where there's evidence of some submarine landsliding. And the black dots 
are places where we know that that landsliding made tsunamis. One of these is the Tacoma Narrows. Three days after a deep, a deep magnitude 7.1 earthquake, uh, this hillside collapsed and generated a tsunami that was about two and a half meters or eight feet high. And these are some houses here um, to give you an idea of the scale here. Another example is in 1894, a submarine landslide that destroyed the docks and caused two fatalities in Commencement Bay. This was not triggered by an earthquake. So these types of events can happen uh, with or without earthquakes. And this is what we believe is the most frequent source of uh, tsunamis here in Washington. We also know that we receive tsunamis from other places. And this animation is showing waves propagating from Alaska. And they reach the coast of Washington um, in just under four hours. We need to be very concerned about uh, these types, um, these types of tsunamis as well, because um, they happen so frequently. This map is showing about the last hundred years or so of large Alaskan earthquakes. Um, this map is showing areas of rupture um, as well as the magnitude and the year that that earthquake occurred. And uh, what's notable is that since the year 1788, there's been 82 observed tsunamis in Alaska, and there's probably others that weren't observed or recorded in any way. This is showing a distribution of tsunami deposits from uh, publications. Each one of these dots represents a, a publication that describes tsunami deposits. And uh, they, the ones along the coast, on the, on the outer coast, the Pacific coast, are uh, very likely from Cascadia, but there's also a whole bunch that are inland. And um, sorting out where they came from is, is some of the work that I'm involved in. Now, one place where there are a lot of tsunami deposits is in Discovery Bay. And Discovery Bay is off of uh, the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and it's between about Port Townsend and Squim. And you can see this tidal marsh here, which we're going to uh, fly down into. And here's what the tidal marsh looks like. And the sediments here preserve a pretty remarkable record of past tsunamis in Washington. Nearby where this photo is taken, uh, I dug this pit. And in this pit, you can see four different tsunami deposits, which are these lighter layers here. And uh, this stick here is a meter long or about three feet long. And these have the ages I'm showing here. This youngest one is likely from the 1700 earthquake. And one of these two is likely from the Cascadia earthquake that preceded the one in 1700. This one here, it's not completely clear what the source of it is. And there's also five additional tsunami deposits below. So some of the work that I've been trying to do is aligning these with sources. There are more deposits here than there are Cascadia earthquakes in the same time frame. So we know that some of these other sources I talked about are almost certainly uh, represented in the geological record here. And with that, I will end and say thank you.